B I O is a B I O. B I O is a B I O. Birdie, birdie, birdie. Welcome. Hi, Alex. Welcome to our first virtual biology camp. Wait, Alex, don't drink that. That's not your cup of soda. Luckily, it was just distilled water with food coloring, but that's a good reason why no food or drinks are allowed in the lab, Alex, which is why we're going to be going over some important rules of lab safety. So don't forget to take good notes. Not so fast, Alex. First, we need to talk about your wardrobe. Well, first of all, no open-toed shoes are allowed in the lab. Alex, watch out for that. Are you okay, Alex? See, that's exactly why we must always wear closed-toed shoes. I'm glad that you're starting to get it, Alex. Now, as for your shorts, I'm afraid so, Alex. No shorts in the lab. You need to make sure that you cover as much skin as possible. Alex, watch out. Your baggy shirt knocked over the beaker and... Well, luckily it was just distilled water, but you won't be so lucky all the time. What if that was a chemical? You could have hurt yourself or others because of your baggy shirt and having your legs exposed. So no baggy clothing and no shorts. And long hair should always be tied back. Sorry, Alex. Crazy hair day is no exception. All long hair must be tied back to avoid any accidents, such as knocking stuff over, allowing it to droop into things, or even catching on fire. Alex, be careful with that open flame. Yes, Alex, that was way too close, which is why we need to be very careful in preventing accidents like these by tying back our long hair and wearing protective lab safety gear. Um, Alex, that won't be necessary. I was thinking more along the lines of lab aprons, goggles, and gloves. I'm afraid those won't work, Alex. Sunglasses or regular glasses are not substitutes for actual lab goggles. They may compromise your vision, shatter, or might not provide enough coverage for your eyes. Now imagine getting a chemical splashed into your eye. Keep in mind that some of these chemicals may cause severe damage or even blindness. Yes, Alex, please don't risk your eyes. Always wear proper safety goggles. But just know that if an accident does occur involving something going into your eyes, it's important for you to know what to do. Alex, what happened? Hurry, flush out your eyes in the eye wash station. What is that red powder on your eyes? Alex, you know that you should avoid touching your face during a lab until you've gotten a chance to wash your hands. And what did we say about no food in the lab? You could have caused an accident from your blurred vision. Well, at least you were close to the eye wash station and you were able to flush out those eyes. Just note that this could have been avoided if you weren't eating in the lab and you were wearing your goggles properly. Keep in mind, Alex, this station is for emergencies, not hot Cheeto related issues. So let's stick to no food in the lab, Alex, and reserve the eye wash station for actual lab emergencies. Same goes for the safety shower. No, Alex, you absolutely cannot pull that lever unless there is a need for it. And no, Alex, missing a shower in PE doesn't count as a need. The safety shower is mainly used when you accidentally get a chemical on your clothes or skin. And if that's the case, you must act quickly by heading to the safety shower and removing all of your clothes. Yes, Alex, all of your clothes, because they may still have chemicals on them. And if they do, those chemicals are going to continue to get absorbed into your skin, which is why in these type of situations, you forget about embarrassment and just do what you need to do for your safety by washing all away all of those chemicals off, which is why there's a huge amount of water that's going to be released to ensure that all chemicals are diluted and washed away. Um, Alex, I don't think that we needed that disturbing mental picture, but how about we move on to fire safety? Yes, Alex, the location and knowledge of how to use a fire extinguisher is very important when it comes to fire safety in the lab. First things first, know where all the exits are in the lab and the location of any available fire extinguishers as well as blankets. No, Alex, not that type of blanket. I mean a fire blanket, which is made up of flame resistant material and helps out put out a person that's on fire. Yes, that's right, Alex. That's why it's important to make sure that you cover up the person tightly so that oxygen won't continue to feed the fire. Okay, Alex, the fire extinguisher is used to put out small fires. To use it, you need to remember the acronym PATH. No, Alex, PATH stands for Pull, Aim, Squeeze, and Sweep, meaning you must first pull the safety pin out then aim the nozzle towards the center of the fire, not the flames, then squeeze the handle while moving the nozzle in a sweeping motion side to side. 
Not so fast, Alex. Just because you know how to use a fire extinguisher doesn't mean that you're going to use it. Your number one person to go to in a lab is your teacher in case of any accidents, injuries, spills, or fires. However, depending on the situation, it is always good for you to know where the fire extinguisher and other safety equipment are located in case your teacher is incapacitated at the moment. And one can only hope that there will never be a need for you to use them. Just remember, you must always notify your teacher immediately regarding any accidents, injuries, or spills. Another important rule you need to remember is that you must always read all lab procedures and listen to your teacher's instructions. No, Alex, you never make up your own experiments. You must always follow your teacher's instructions and ask your teacher before doing something that is not clearly stated in the lab procedure. That's right, Alex, you must always practice safety in the lab, which means that you must always consider and handle all chemicals to be dangerous, meaning you must never touch, taste, or smell any chemicals in the lab. Yes, Alex, even table salt. Sometimes harmless chemicals, when mixed, can become extremely dangerous. You also need to keep in mind that when diluting acids, you must do it carefully by adding acid into water so that you can avoid accidents. Yes, Alex, that's a great way to remember the rule. A for acid to W for water. Another thing to keep in mind is that when you're transferring chemicals, you must be very careful because you never know, accidents sometimes happen, which is why you should become familiar with an MSDS sheet of every chemical you work with, even table salt, so that you can know what to do in case of an accident. Quick, Alex, go to the eye wash station again. The MSDS sheet says that you must flush out your eyes for at least 15 minutes. See, Alex, that's what an MSDS sheet is for. It tells you what to do if the chemical gets ingested, inhaled, comes in contact with your eyes or skin, etc. That's why it's important to be familiar with these before working with the chemicals. And Alex, what happened to your goggles again? No, Alex, goggles hanging from your neck doesn't count. You must never take off your goggles. You never know when an accident can happen. So we must always be prepared, which is why it's important that you always stay at your workstation and never joke around because it can lead to accidents. Alex, watch out. Are you all okay? No, Alex, that's okay. When you break glass, just immediately notify your teacher and stand back while she cleans it up to avoid anyone from getting cut by the glass. Then, once all the glass is picked up, it is then disposed of inside of a broken glass container. Something like that, Alex. At least regarding any accidents, injuries, spills, fires, broken glass, etc. Basically, you inform your teacher immediately about any trouble. I'm glad you brought that up, Alex, because we are going to be dissecting in class, which is why it's extremely important that you understand that when working with specimen, you always act responsibly and treat them with respect. No, Alex, the frogs that we're going to be dissecting will not take the stage to become dancing frogs, so don't mistreat them. Overall, when conducting a lab, it's important that you maintain a clean work area and avoid clutter. You not only need to handle all lab equipment carefully, but you also need to be careful where cords are placed. Because when you leave them hanging from lab tables, someone can trip, and all of the stools need to be pushed away as well as backpacks and books. Then, at the end of every lab, you need to make sure that you clean your entire area. Wait, Alex, don't dump that into the sink. You must always ask your teacher how to dispose of any waste, because certain things are safe to be disposed of down the drain, but others must be disposed of in special waste containers or trash, such as solid waste from dissections. Okay, Alex, now that you have a basic understanding of lab safety, I think that you're ready to start doing lab experiments and even design your own science fair project. Um, Alex, that's not the types of experiments I'm talking about. I know, Alex, sometimes the difficult part is getting started. But if you follow the basic principles of the scientific method, you will see that developing your science fair project isn't that difficult once you select a topic. First thing is selecting a topic, which is based on your observations and asking questions. Seems like you have something in mind, Alex. Now that you have a topic in mind, try to come up with a question or a problem regarding that topic. Awesome, Alex. Now you have your question. But notice, this is not the only question or problem that can be looked at regarding this topic. For instance, what about are athletes more effective at making larger bubbles 
as opposed to non-athletes? Or does the age of the person affect the bubble size that they can make? Overall, many possible questions may be derived from that single topic. But for the purposes of this example, we're going to select this question that you were thinking of. And now we need to try to answer this question with an educated guess based on our previous observations. And we call this a hypothesis. Great job, Alex. Your hypothesis is clearly attempting to answer your question and providing a way to test it. So now we just need to explain step by step as to what we're going to do to test it and the materials that are going to be needed to do so. Great job, Alex. Now you just need to test each of these brands by following this procedure and collecting data. Okay, Alex, enough with the bubble popping. What did your data look like? Great job, Alex. Now analyze the data by processing the trial averages of each brand of gum and displaying them on a graph which will allow you to interpret the results of the experiment. What did you notice, Alex? Do you see how your data shows bubble size increasing as sugar content increases as well? So what do you think that that means regarding your hypothesis? Should you reject or accept your hypothesis? Yes, Alex, you're right. This data could lead you to believe that your hypothesis could be accepted since brand C contains the most sugar and the average bubble size is at least 5% difference in size to the other brands with less sugar, which is basically what you would state in your conclusion. Not quite there yet, Alex. As scientists, a hypothesis must be tested numerous times to prove that they are in fact correct without reasonable doubt. Once numerous and extensive experimentation has been conducted so that you can eliminate doubts and become a well-established, highly reliable explanation, which often takes many, many years, we may refer to it as a scientific theory. In the case of our experiment, we are far from that because other factors may affect our results, giving us a false conclusion. Your conclusion is on the right track, Alex, because this would not be the end of this experiment. You would require further testing, as you mentioned. Now, a good follow-up experiment would be to test the gum with various sugar amounts, but from the same brand, meaning same ingredients. This would limit the variables present in your experiment to only sugar amounts. Then a follow-up experiment to that one would be the gum with the same amount of sugar, but different brands, meaning different ingredients. Overall, as you can see, Alex, one experiment may lead to numerous others, which is why some scientists will often continue the research that others have done based on their publications. This concludes our virtual biology camp lecture on lab safety. Hope you enjoyed it, and that's it. Have a great one. Mm-hmm. <laughs>